Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O-Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. I hope this transmission finds you all happy and healthy and allergen-free as we march into spring here in the Northern Hemisphere. And hey, welcome to part two, let's call it P2, of a continuing conversation with blogger Recluse. This one is long overdue, but sometimes other things just pop up and you gotta roll with them. Now for those of you who don't know Recluse, he's a meticulous alt-research blogger who explores topics such as mind control, deep politics, the occult, the supernatural, high weirdness, and Fortiana in all of its fucked up forms. And this chat builds off our last one from last June, which we recap at the start of our conversation, so I won't repeat all that here. But this series is about one of the lesser known and lesser discussed sources of power in times both past and present. You might call it Times New Roman, if you smell what I'm cooking. We started with the Knights of Malta, and now we're spiraling out into some other related groups and their ties to governments, organized religions, banks, multinational corporations, intelligence agencies, killers for hire, and mafiosos across the world. Now, this episode is still very much table setting, just another information dump, but it is chapter two of a story that brings together the Catholic Church's historical interest in the occult, population control, and political subversion. It is, as Recluse has called it, a strange and terrible journey into the heart of the deep state. Now, one quick note on Recluse's audio, he was on a landline, and while his voice is clearly understood, there is some interference at times, and I'm pretty sure the line was tapped as well. You will definitely hear some audio oddities in the background while he's speaking. Maybe I'm being a bit hyperbolic there, but hey, you never know. Because what's a strange and terrible journey into the heart of the deep state without them monitoring your every move along the way? So let's make like one of those Catholic bishops and move up and to the right. It's a chess reference for anybody keeping score. But let's, <laughs> but let's make that move up and to the right, where novels by Dan Brown and Dave Eggers set the stage for not-so-fictional narratives playing out in the shadows of a mass near you. Enjoy. Recluse, welcome back to the show. It's been far too long, and that's my fault for not following up on this sooner. But we're here now, and that's all that matters. Good to talk to you again, my friend. How are things down in your neck of the woods? Well, as you know, it's it's definitely been a bit of a journey getting back here. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to do this chat, I believe, back in the middle of January, and I had to uh, postpone it there myself because of another project I'm working on. And then we were supposed to do this in February, and then my uh, landline promptly died on me. I'm sure for many of you who aren't aware of my circumstances, I live out in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia. My cell phone doesn't work out here, and my internet is pretty sucky, too. So I can't really do this kind of stuff without my landline and my... My landline, of course, was out for nearly a month. We were set up to do this interview uh, last week, and literally as I had gotten on Skype and Ryan and I had said hello to one another, my power went out, and I was without power here at the cabin for um, almost six days, <laughs> which first uh, <laughs> yeah. forced another postponement. But <laughs> it's, it's been a journey here, but we're finally here now, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. it's uh, It's been an interesting trek just to get back on the call here, so... You know, in our last chat, though, we did an overview of sorts on the hidden history of a group known as the Knights of Malta and also the notorious P2 Masonic Lodge in Turin, Italy, and how those two groups and things are connected. We talked about how the Knights were formed, uh, their connection to the Knights Templar and the the Assassins, uh, rubbing shoulders with some of the more esoteric groups like the Yazidis, the Mandeans, and the Sufis, uh, the Knights' interest in alchemy, this label of the Men in Black and how that relates to the group, uh, the connection between the Knights and Freemasonry, which is where we then broke off into the P2 discussion and its formation and connection to the Vatican and, you know, things like Operation Gladio, uh, the Vatican banking scandal, the bizarre death of Pope John Paul I, the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II, and the years of lead in Italy, which was a 20-year period of sociopolitical turmoil and terrorism in the country that encapsulated these events that I just listed off. And all this, of course, can be uh, tied to the birth and the work of modern intelligence agencies, uh, both here in the States and abroad. So if anyone hasn't heard that yet, I'll link it in the show notes, and I would recommend uh, firing it up before this one, or at least giving Recluse's blog entries on these subjects a read that will ground this conversation that we're about to have a bit better for you. Because this time, 
Recluse, I'd like to get into some other related groups and offshoots here of the Knights of Malta. And I'd like to begin with Opus Dei, or Opus Die. I don't know really how we're pronouncing that, but we did mention them briefly in the first chat when talking about the P2 Lodge, because they have a connection there with the Lodge's founder, Lysio Gelli. Now, Opus, and I'm going to say Die. Is that appropriate, Opus Die? I believe it's Die. I'm not... You know, honestly, I spent almost an hour looking up how to pronounce some of the words and names that we're going to be go over here, and it never occurred to me to actually look up the Opus D. And, but yes, okay, Opus Die works for me. Great, chat. so... Hopefully we're not throwing it up. <laughs> all right, well, even if we are, uh, whatever. So, <laughs> Opus Die is a, a group that I first heard about while reading the Da Vinci Code, of all things. They're one of the antagonists involved in the storyline of that novel, and I imagine that anyone who has heard of them probably has read that book, but the difference between the real organization and the portrayal of them by Dan Brown is an important distinction to make. And in one of your blogs, you wrote that, uh, quote, In said work, the organization has largely been reduced to the status of supervillains, but the influence of the real-life institute has been both vast and subtle. To this day, the role Opus Dei played in the Great Vatican Banking Scandal and its ties to P2 have largely been ignored. Before addressing these ties, however, a bit should be said about the organization to separate the reality from Brown's fever dreams, end quote. So, Recluse, give us a dose of that reality, if you don't mind. Where did this group originate, and why and what is their end game? Well, it originated in Spain uh, in 1928. The uh, founder was uh, Jose Maria Escrivia, I believe is how it's pronounced. I'm terrible at these pronunciations. This is why I write instead of two podcast normally, <laughs> but um, from very early on, they received support from Franco's government, especially in the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War, and there's, of course, allegations that Gelli and uh, Jose Maria had encountered each other during the Spanish Civil War when uh, Gelli was fighting as a partisan for the fascist faction at that point in time, but I haven't been able to definitively confirm that, but it would certainly be something that uh, was highly plausible, but for Opus Dei, it really took off after the Second World War war, and it's never really been conclusively proven just how exactly it occurred so much power in such a, you know, brief time period. I mean, obviously, it was getting support from Franco's government, but Spain was, you know, hardly an international powerhouse at this point in time. One explanation that was put forward uh, was its involvement in the rat lines, which would be highly probable. The rat lines, for those of you aren't aware, who are unaware, were networks that were established by the U.S. intelligence community and remnants of the uh, Nazi intelligence apparatus in the aftermath of the Second World War to kind of spirit away the Nazi assets out of Europe into South America and other areas so that they could avoid prosecution. And Spain was at the forefront of this in the early years, were one of the first rat lines. Actually, I think the first one originated in Spain, now that I think about it. So there's a strong chance with that, but... Another interesting aspect about Opus Dei that's very rarely mentioned was its possible ties to the Golden Lily Fund. I should probably preface by saying Golden Lily, is. there's a lot of controversy over how accurate are the reports of it are, whether it exists or not, but I tend to treat it as fact because it's based on a lot of the circumstantial evidence I've turned up. It's highly probable for its existence, but to give you a rundown of this, because I know this isn't a topic a lot of people are familiar with, so people know that the Germans heavily looted the countries that they invaded and conquered during the Second World War, and they spirited a lot of these funds away. And allegedly, a lot of them were rolled into what became known as the Black Eagle Trust, which was supposedly the slush fund that was going to be used to fund the post-war Nazi International. Now, the Japanese did something very similar, but by a lot of the accounts that have come out, the Japanese were actually much more systematic about this. When they invaded countries, they would go in and they would loot everything, including a lot of these just precious religious icons, Buddhist statues and things like that that were made out of gold. And they would melt them down into gold bars and what have you so that it would be all but impossible to repatriate these items to their you know, rightful owners after the war was over with. And a lot of the allegations go that the Japanese established these massive underground vaults and the Philippines and Japan to store a lot of this looted gold in in the aftermath of the war to help the empire come back after it had been conquered. Now, during the winding down period of the Second World War in the Pacific Theater, Douglas MacArthur and his notorious intelligence chief, General Charles Willoughby, allegedly found out about this slush fund, and they were able to cover some of the vaults that were in the Philippines. 
And there was a particular soldier who was detached with them. He was named uh, Santa Romana. He's usually referred to simply as Santi, however. Uh, I believe he was a Filipino, but he might have had some Spanish ancestry as well. I can't remember now off the top of my head. But anyway, for whatever reason, Santi essentially became one of the, the principal curators of this slush fund in the aftermath during the Cold War period. And Sandy had contacts with the U.S. intelligence community, but it's been argued that his real loyalty was to the Vatican, and specifically it was to Opus Dei, which he was reputed to be a member of. And certainly, I mean, if any of this is true, it would really help explain how Opus Dei, you know, emerged so suddenly as a major power in the uh, Cold War era, because, I mean, this amount of gold is believed to be, you know, none inconsiderate. I mean, it might constitute close to a third of the total gold in the world right now that's known, at least in some estimates I've seen. It was it was an enormous, enormous amount of gold that's basically been hoarded in this kind of, you know, underground network for years that's been used at various points in time to fix elections and to suppress the world price of gold and so forth. But it would certainly provide a plausible explanation as to how, I mean, Opus Dei ended up with so much power in such a very brief period of time. Yeah, so, you know, you have a quote here that you shared in one of your blogs from Dr. John, I'm going to say Roche. Uh, he's an Oxford University lecturer and former member of Opus Dei. He described the group as sinister, secretive, and Orwellian, and you also noted the group loves them some self-mortification, which you point out resembles the tried and true techniques of brainwashing. Do we know anything about these self-mortification slash brainwashing practices that this group was or is participating in? Yes, I mean, some of it's uh, come out, of course. Self-flagellation was very popular. I mean, apparently the founder, Jose Maria, would essentially kneel before, uh, I believe it was a black cross in the mornings when he woke up and he would basically whip himself bloody while he uh, contemplated it. And this was a practice that quite a few of the members embraced over the years. I don't know if they necessarily knelt before a black cross, per se, but self-flagellation was definitely a major factor in the early days of Opus Dei. Uh, many of the female members were required to wear an instrument, I believe that's called a stillus or something to that effect. It was the spiked chain that they would put around their thighs that would essentially dig into it as they walked around during the day. Uh, and then also, of course, they were, in many cases, uh, asked to uh, sleep on the floor, to kiss the ground when they woke up. There were typically extended periods of silence in opus Dei houses. And a lot of times the members have actually lived with one another to kind of reinforce the sense of community. And typically there would be imposed silences after the evening prayer and the mornings when they woke up. The sexes were rigorously separated. Celibacy was, you know, highly promoted within the organization. But probably one of the most damaging aspects were the weekly confessions that they were required to make. The local directors were essentially required to dispel or divulge anything that they had done that might be remotely considered sinful. And a lot of times this was held over the heads of the members, you know, for various reasons. But it's kind of interesting because a lot of what the Opusians were doing were actually similar to what was being done in uh, Chile at the Colonia Dignidad, which was kind of, uh, I suppose, a Nazi comedy that had been set up by a man named Paul Schaefer there during the uh, early 1960s. Peter Lavinia was the first writer to really chronicle them in his classic Unholy Alliance. And I was rather struck, really, um, in doing a lot of research between the similarities between the Opusians and some of the techniques that were used at the colony. But that in and of itself, I suppose, isn't necessarily that surprising because Opus Dei actually had a considerable presence in Chile during this time. I actually think it was their largest mission outside of Europe for many years, though it should be emphasized, obviously, Opus Dei is a Catholic organization and the colony was a Protestant one. But um, there's definitely, I mean, some similarities between the methods that they used and then some other sort of nominally Christian cults, such as the Unification Church as well. Yeah, and so back to that quote from Dr. Roche about the group being sinister and secretive and Orwellian, you wrote that, uh, quote, ultimately these accounts of self-mortification are some of the most tame charges lobbied against the group. Uh, this researcher, you, uh, has stumbled upon several compelling accounts of ritualistic sexual abuse committed by members of Opus Dei against minors, uh, end quote. And the allegations, uh, as you go on to point out, are highly speculative, but that's what podcasts like this are for. And considering the ties this group has to the Vatican and the Knights of Malta and so on, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some, uh, let's call it sexual fuckery going on. Is that something you want to speculate on here? Because you didn't write a whole lot about it on your blog. Yeah, well, it's 
it's hard to get a lot of evidence on this, especially since many of the texts that kind of deal with this are in French or um, Dutch, uh, which makes it a little difficult. But probably the most compelling allegation came from Belgium, made by an individual named Jacques Thomas, or Tomé, I believe, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, but he was a member of the youth wing of the political party, the PSC, which featured a lot of figures from this kind of right-wing establishment that was involved in the Belgium's own years of lead, which was generally known as the bloody 80s. But anyway, this network had been widely linked to uh, pedophilia, of course. Mark de Trucks was later outed in the uh, late 90s, and there were a lot of allegations that he had been... Uh, Mark de Trucks, by the way, was butcher of Belgium. He was a notorious serial killer that was convicted in the early part of this century. He had kept several women, many of the minors, as prisoners in his house, and there were allegations that some of the females that he had procured were some for some VIPs in the Belgium establishments. But anyway, um, going back to the 1980s, Jacques uh, Tomei had made these allegations that... Um, in the years 1985 and 1986, he had attended several mass orgies, and the details from these were just incredible. I mean, they reportedly involved Satanism, the drinking of blood, and also the raping of girls that were in the ages of 13 or 14, and reportedly one of them died on the altar while Kama was there. At one point he had asked what the purpose of the spectacle was, and he was told that it was an opus die initiation ritual. Now, again, I you know, she definitely emphasized here that there's not a lot of evidence that come out, credible evidence that Opus Dye was involved in pedophilia or, I mean, some kind of black or snuff networks or something like that. But certainly given the, the particular history of Belgium and the, uh, the compelling evidence that's come out over the years that for decades a lot of the elite in the country were being compromised by these kind of pedophile networks, it's something that would have to be given some consideration in the case of Tama. I mean, he had made these allegations to the police. There's actually a police report that was filed on this. You can find an English language version of it finally at the Institute of Study of uh, Covert Politics, Globalization and Covert Politics, which has really done some Herculean work on trying to expose some of these networks. But, uh, I mean, it's a very unsettling prospect. And another factor that gives credence to this, I think, on some level is the fact that evidence has come out that the CIA have been using Opus Dye to help establish some of these, you know, Gladio networks that were spread across Western Europe and so forth during the Cold War. And it certainly seems that one of the aspects of these networks was compiling um, compromising material that could be used as blackmail. In the case of P2, for instance, which has been extensively linked to Italy's Gladio network, Gelli generally required new members who were being initiated into the lodge to divulge personal secrets of theirs that were compromising as well as secrets on other members or people that they were potentially looking at as members of the P2 lodge at some point. So Gelli ended up compiling a lot of blackmail material in this fashion, and I would imagine that at least some of it was sexual in nature. Yeah, you would have to think so, just based on the nature of the connections that they have to some of these groups that have already been linked to, to such behavior. And, you know, some other fuckery going on that's not so speculative is the involvement of the group in Operation Gladio, which you just mentioned. And uh, we did talk about that in our first chat, but could you give folks a brief overview of what that operation is and then tell us how Opus Die may have been involved? Well, uh, Gladio, I mean, I should probably start off by saying it wasn't actually called Gladio. Gladio was simply the name of the Italian component, but um, we don't know what the actual overall project was referred to. That's never really been divulged publicly. I tend to use Gladio because it's a little easier to say than just, you know, the state behind networks of Western Europe or something like that. But each nation, essentially, the the program had a different name. In Turkey, it was counter guerrilla In Greece, it was red sheepskin, for instance. But these were all kind of interconnected. And essentially, they went back to really the end of the Second World War, the onset of the Cold War. And at the time, military policymakers and intelligence officials and what have you were concerned about a Soviet invasion of uh, Europe. And there was a general sense that the United States may not be able to stop the Russians from invading if they chose to. So Gladio was devised as a means of essentially setting up these quote-unquote stay-behind networks that in the event of an invasion could wage a guerrilla war essentially with assistance from U.S. special forces who would be covertly deployed there to aid them in this endeavor. At least uh, that was the theory anyway. In actuality, they recruited a lot of really far-right and other kind of criminal organizations into this network in part because they were 
deemed to be the ones that were most reliably anti-communist. The most mainstream was the Catholic Church itself, obviously, which I think would be where the connection to Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta came from. In the case of both of these orders, these were very reactionary networks. They were many things, obviously, but they certainly were not sympathetic to communism. And then also uh, the mafia would have been incorporated into this. The mafia, while being many things, are certainly firm believers in the system of free enterprise. And finally, you had a lot of this kind of Nazi underground, fascist underground that had survived the Second World War, which were also heavily incorporated. And in some cases, I mean, Mussolini had already kind of established a sort of Gladio network prior to the end of the Second World War, and it seems like this network was kind of also kept in place and used concurrently with the quote-unquote official Gladio network. And that one might have been the actual one that was linked to a lot of terrorism that unfolded in Italy during the 1980s. But it was a very murky underground, and you had sort of these official gladiators, the legitimate groups, quote-unquote, that had been trained to organize for the defense of Europe, and then you had a lot of these kind of fascist paramilitary networks and what have you that were also receiving training, but which appeared to have been used for more sinister purposes, essentially. Uh, you also said that there's little doubt that Opus Dei was connected to the P2 Lodge, which you mentioned in that answer. Uh, the most obvious connection being to the financial empire of Roberto Calvi, who we mentioned in the first chat. He was known as God's Banker. Tell us a little bit about him and where that nickname comes from and how he connects P2 with Opus Dei. Well, Calvi uh, was who was tasked essentially with handling a lot of the investments for the uh, Vatican Bank through his uh, Banco Ambrosia financial empire. He essentially had taken over this role from um, Shelton Dona, who had originally been the you know, major financial uh, patron for the, not patron, but uh, financial advisor, if you will, to the Vatican in the uh, 70s. And then uh, Dona started to have a lot of legal problems for various reasons. Of course, he was highly connected to the mafia, which I'm sure didn't help. <laughs> but anywho, uh, Calva was essentially, uh, this was how he got the title God's Banker, because he did handle a lot of the investments for the Vatican. And it really seems like there was an overlap between this kind of shadow Obasian banking structure, or underground banking networks, if you will. Another connection I had recently found was the one to the Black Prince, uh, Borges, who had attempted to lead a coup d'etat in Italy in 1971. It was really a bit of a comedy of errors. They had essentially taken over the uh, interior ministry and so forth. They armed up these you know, kind of fascist paramilitary gangs. They had had parts of the army join them, and they were deploying tanks, I guess, to certain areas of the country for the coup. And then it's around midnight, Borges gets this call. He picks it up. He listens to the phone for a few minutes. He comes back to his subordinates and tells them that the coup is off because he had received superior instructions, I suppose. But anyway, um, Borges had started out in the 60s trying to get some money, and he had ended up uh, being given this bank by Sindona, the uh, Banca di Credito Commercio e Industrio, BCCI, which is not the really notorious BCCI, which was founded in Pakistan. I believe this was an Italian bank that had no connection to it, but it did have a considerable degree of investments from Opus Dei, uh, which is interesting because I said before, Sindona had actually been the one who controlled it, and he was big banker for P2 for a lot of years before he was succeeded by Calvia, and then he turned it over effectively to Borges, who would go on to attempt this coup d'etat that P2 had been extensively linked to in 1971. So it seems like a lot of these kind of shadow banks that Opus Dei was controlling uh, were also providing covert financial support to P2. Calvia was the most you know, public example of this. We also talked last time about the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II, but only briefly. It turns out, though, that he was connected to Opus Dei in some way before that event, and then that connection became even clearer after that assassination attempt. Uh, tell us a bit about Pope John Paul II and Opus Dei and how they interacted during this time period. Well, John Paul II, based on a lot of my research, seems to have gotten the support in the Cura by the Opusians using their factions that they have mustered in there and selected. The Cura is essentially the Senate, if you will, of the Vatican. Whenever the Pope dies, this is the body that is tasked with electing a new Pope. And by the time of John Paul II's ascension, I mean, they, uh, the Opusians had an extensive presence in the Cura at the time. And upon being confirmed as the new pope in 1982, John Paul had uh, issued a decree known as the Apostolic Constitution, I believe. But effectively, it made Opus Dei a official structure of the Vatican. 
And then in 2002, he had canonized Jose Maria, essentially elevating him to the level of sainthood. So <laughs> John Paul definitely had a soft spot in his heart for the Opusians. There seems to be little question of that. Yeah, and you also noted in one of your blogs that the events here with the attempted assassination and so on were part of a power struggle playing out between uh, various players involved with Operation Gladio. You wrote that the Anglo-American establishment needed organizations such as P2 and Opus Dei to maintain its homogeny over Europe. Why was that? Why did they need these groups? Well, essentially, as I kind of got in, you know, to before, I mean, they were the, really the only truly reliable anti-communist partners that they could find, especially in Central Europe. I mean, going back to the aftermath of the Second World War, the national communist parties in a lot of the you know mainland European countries were very strong, especially in France and Italy and uh, Belgium, because they had been a part of the resistance that had helped defeat Hitler. And there was always a perpetual concern that one of these communist parties would be democratically elected, especially in Italy and to a lesser extent France. So that definitely pushed them into this sort of awkward alliance with you know these very far right wing groups. But I mean, it wasn't always a it was certainly, I would say, more of a marriage of convenience, if you will, because there were, I mean, obviously these various factions were quite anti-communist, genuinely so, but they also had many other goals that were not necessarily uh, in lockstep with one another, let's just say. In the case of some of the really radical fascist parties, especially those that were associated with the occultist and philosopher Julius Evola, I mean, these could be quite hostile to Catholicism and capitalism in particular, which probably would have led to some major issues down the line had any of these fascist parties really gained a degree of power within any of the European nations that they were being used in. I also want to bring this group P3 into the story here. We haven't touched on that group yet, so tell people a little bit about P3 and what association this particular organization has with Opus Dei as well. Well, P3, there was actually multiple of these propaganda laws spread around Europe. P1 was in France, P2 was in Italy, of course, P3 was in Spain. And then there was also a uh, P7 that I've been able to uncover, which was in Belgium. P7 actually seems to have been one of the major conduits of funding for the Italian P2 Lodge as well, though there's still a lot of controversy surrounding the claims around P7, which were made by uh, Richard Bernanke. But anywho, uh, getting back to P3, it was originated in Spain with the Grand Master being Pio Cabanellas, who also, like Gelli, kept secret files on a lot of his members. Now, Cabanellas was a director on uh, Banco Occidental, which was another Opus Dei bank. Uh, quite a few of the affiliates in there were deeply, deeply entwined with Opus Dei. And it had also received loans from the Banco Ambrosiano, which was Robert Cavalla's bank. So, again, it was just this really kind of incestuous network of these various banks in Spain and Italy and so forth that these technocrats from Opus Dei were kind of behind and held using to channel funds to P2 and various other groups. Fortunately, there's very much known about P1, which was located in France, though that would have probably been quite interesting based on some of the other organizations that we'll delve into here in a minute. Yeah, and one of them that I want to touch on is this group called Les Cercles. Is that how you would say that? I believe it's circle. It's circle. Okay, well, so I'm not going to say terrible. it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I did, gonna, I did yeah. though, like, listen to how it was pronounced online for about 20 minutes straight, though. I think I'm getting this one, but I don't want to make any promises. Okay, well, I don't know how you even just said that, so I'm going to say... Call say, it the circle if you want to. That okay, let's call it the circle. circle. Sure, all right. So we're going to dig into this group called The Circle now. Uh, you mentioned them briefly in our first chat, but we didn't go into any detail on them. So let's try to set them up in the same way we've just set up Opus Dei. And I say try because of all the groups we've discussed so far, this one seems to be the most difficult to research. And maybe that's the best place to start, actually. So why would The Circle be so difficult to find information on? Well, certainly, it's, it's been suppressed for many years. I mean, there were a couple of very brief given in Brian Crozier's autobiography, uh, Free Agent. Crozier was the founder of the Institute for the Study of Conflict, uh, which was a big right-wing think tank in the U.K. in the 1970s and the 1980s, and he had also had a decade-spanning uh, affiliation with both MI6 and the CIA. 
he had actually received a lot of money for years from Richard Mellon Scaife, who was a big CIA financier. He was an American and part of the you know legendary Mellon family from Pittsburgh. Anyway, Crozier was one of the first people to really talk about it. David Rockefeller also briefly mentioned the group in his biography that came out in 2000. But there was really, there still has not yet to be a full-length account of it officially published. The great David Teacher, who was a journalist for Lobster Magazine, had written an excellent book on it called Rogue Agents back in the early 90s, and he essentially has never been able to find a publisher for it, so it is now available for free at the Institute for the Study of Globalization and Convert Politics, which I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in these topics go to immediately and find this book. It's really a just a treasure trove of information. And then also you have ISGP itself. Uh, ISGP was really the first online source that really attempted to do any degree of research on Le Cercle. And of course, ISGP has been really blacklisted over this. I think originally the curator of ISGP had tried to get Alex Jones of uh, you know, obviously InfoWars to publish it on InfoWars back around 2006, and he had effectively refused. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, even within you know, quote-unquote, alternative research communities and what have you, there is a reluctance to tackle this. And in the case of Alex Jones, there's most assuredly a good reason for this, is the Sucre was the organization that really helped sponsor, I mean, a lot of these kind of alternative right-wing groups over the years in Europe, and they were affiliated with many of the American partners that Alex Jones really derived from. But um, anywho, as to the circle... It had its origins in the United Europe movement. The first such group that was created for this purpose was the Pan-European Union, the PEU, which was founded by Kamante Kavinhov Calgaria, I believe, though don't hold me to that, in 1923. So this was the first attempt there was to sort of establish a United Europe movement. It didn't really amount to much, though, but in the aftermath of the Second World War and just the you know, other devastation that Europe had gone through, the prospect of the United Europe suddenly now had much greater appeal. However, there was a lot of concern amongst the conservative backers in the PEU and within the CIA that um, Clariga was not sufficiently anti-communist enough. So in 1948, the CIA had helped establish the European movement, which was funded, or headed by Joseph Redinger, and that in turn was also received a lot of support from the American Committee of the United Europe, which again had a lot of high-ranking U.S. intelligence figures in it. There was William Donovan, the director of the OSS. There was Alan Dulles, the longtime CIA director, and so forth. And finally, the other organization that was sort of set up for this purpose of the United Europe movement was, the, of course, the infamous Bilderberg Group, which was established in the early 50s. And the circle originally began as something of an auxiliary of the Bilderberg Group in the 1952-1953 period. The founders were the longtime German Chancellor Conrad Adenauer, I believe, the French band Antoine Tonnet. Franz Joseph Strauss, who was a defense minister in Germany and a longtime, you know, mover and shaker in the country. Giulio Andradia, who was the longtime prime minister in Italy, and a mysterious French man known as Jean Violet. And the thing that is interesting about these five personalities is that pretty much all of them were linked to either the Knights of Malta or Opus Dei. Uh, Conrad, let's just call German Chancellor Conrad, was a uh, Knight of Malta. Benet was a Knight of Malta. Violet was most likely a Knight of Malta, though I haven't been able to uh, prove that definitively yet. Andradia was definitely a Knight of Malta. Franz Joseph Strauss was believed to be a member of Opus Dei. This hasn't been definitively confirmed, but he did have quite a few affiliates who were members of Opus Dei, or linked to the group in some fashion or other. And Violet was also believed to have been a member of Opus Dei. Certainly, he did a lot of work for Opus Dei over the years. So... Essentially, the core of the group in the early years was largely French and German, with some Italians in it. As far as I can tell, there were no American or British in the group at this point in time. And I think that was partly due to just the fact that they felt that they needed some kind of counterbalance to the you know, Anglo or the, just the American and the Northern European elites that really dominated the Bilderberg group. Of course, the big partners in Bilderberg were usually Americans, British, and to lesser extent, people from the Netherlands, most notably Prince Bernard, whereas Le Cercle was kind of a 
at least in the early years, an attempt to sort of give this reactionary Catholic faction from mainland Europe its own voice in this emerging global order, if you will. So you mentioned some of the founders, those five personalities there. You mentioned Antoine Panay, who is sometimes the namesake of the group, and maybe you could tell us why that is. But I also want to point out that, you know, while he was maybe the front man for the group for many years, the man that you mentioned, Jean Violet, is generally credited with turning the circle into a major international player. And he's generally depicted as a rather buffoonish figure, as you said in your blog, and the few mainstream accounts profiling him. And this is in no small part to his involvement in a bizarre scandal involving what they call sniffer airplanes that rocked France and to a lesser extent Spain and Italy as well. Uh, This was in the 1970s. So we need to take a quick detour here and talk more about this sniffer plane scandal, which you referred to in your blog as the sniffer planes of the alchemists. What the heck is this scandal, and what's it have to do with alchemy? Yes, yes, it was. It's definitely quite an interesting scandal that developed here. The origins of this started in 1965, and there were two people who had come up with this concept of different planes. One was a Belgian named Elaine de Velgus, I believe, and another one was quote unquote Professor Aldo Benassoli, uh, I believe, who was actually a TV repairman. These guys had a keen interest in alchemy and flying saucers, and they believed that through studying these kind of new age technologies, quote-unquote, they had figured out a way that they could detect water essentially underground. It was sort of a means, I guess, of dowsing or something like that, where they had developed these techniques that could uncover hidden reserves of fresh water underground, which in the late 60s was seen as being highly important, especially in Spain, where the original interest for this came from, because Spain had always had kind of water shortages in this time frame. However, the scheme changed dramatically in the early 70s because of the Arab oil embargoes, and suddenly these two figures came around and said, well, we can also use this technology to sniff for oil underground. And anyway, they ended up getting support from Violet and uh, Panay and I believe several of the other uh, Soclip members. And they originally, I believe, went to the South Africans to try to use this technique to try to uncover oil reserves down in South Africa, and that failed. So next they went to um, BLF, which was France's state-owned oil company, and they had convinced them of the merits of this technology, which was probably aided a lot by Violet's contacts. I haven't really gotten into this yet, but Violet was a French intelligence asset. He also was an asset of the BND, which was Germany's uh, principal foreign intelligence service, and he was an asset of the Vatican. But um, anyway, Violet had used his state contacts. He had gotten the ELF to give a lot of funding uh, to the Sniffer airplane scandal, and this went on until almost the early 1980s, I believe, until somebody realized that the technology was complete and utter garbage. It didn't work at all. And in the process, they had siphoned away millions of dollars from the French government. And I believe close to 50 million of it was never accounted for. And there's some speculation that the money had been siphoned off by Violet, who was using this kind of sniffer plane scandal as a way to raise funds. And he had then used this money to fund many of his more extreme political interests throughout the continent and the world in general. Yeah, I thought that was a super fascinating anecdote. I just wanted to share that. And you also said that the uh, the sniffer plane scandal may then have been another front to raise money, in this case primarily from the government of France, uh, superficially for this curious invention, but in actuality was meant to funnel money uh, after a generous skin by the major players to such causes the Vatican had become obsessed with under Pope John Paul II. Is there anything more to say about that? Not really, like I said, I mean, it was mainly, I mean, I could say also that the the original, now that I remember, the original support, it came from the Spanish government, and it had been some of the Obasian technocrats who had actually started out with the initial investments, and then it went to South Africa, and then finally to France. But yes, it had managed to hoodwake multiple governments here in at least two different continents in this particular scheme of airplanes that could apparently sniff for oil and water underground. Yeah, so I want to go back to some of the membership of this group, because of interest there is the presence of Archduke Otto von Habsburg in the circle. Uh, who was the Archduke, and you know what do we know about his association with this group? 
Well, I mean, of course, he was the, you know, the most notable descendant at this time of the Habsburg dynasty who had headed the Holy Roman Empire. I believe we even talked about this in the prior podcast that uh, the Habsburgs have had, you know, I think extensive uh, involvement with the Knights of Malta over the years going back to, I think, at least like the 16th century, if not earlier. They essentially were, I mean, one of the families that have almost always had members within the Maltese Knights for many, many years now. But there were some accounts that um, at least some factions within Le Cercle were interested in setting up Habsburg essentially as a neo-Holy Roman emperor for United Europe. And, I mean, that's something that I should probably bring up now, obviously. Uh, Le Cercle was, like the Bilderberg group in the early years, obsessed with uniting Europe. But it certainly had a much more aristocratic version of what they wanted for Europe as opposed to the more you know, financial-driven vision that the Bilderberg group uh, had been plotting, which probably led to a increasing degree of rifts over the years between the two different organizations. But Habsburg was the man that Le Cercle had been interested in as the figurehead for this kind of neo-Holy Roman Empire. He was actually, I believe, the last serving Holy Roman Emperor and then lost the title after the uh, Austro-Hungary Empire was defeated in the First World War. I think of interest, too, here is this term clerical fascism that you use to describe the circle. Do you mind elaborating on that and what that means exactly? I mean, essentially, it was an attempt to merge to merge a really right-wing Catholicism uh, with the tenets of fascism, which, you know, produced some mixed results, I would say, at times over the years. But very much so, I would say that the merger of clerical fascism really became the dominant form of fascism in the post World War II years, especially in Latin America, where there was a very close collaboration between very right-wing Catholic elements and um, these kind of neo-fascist, neo-Nazi groups and what have you. Yeah, and I think another group that ties in here, too, uh, with what you were just saying about that clerical fascism uh, that I want to tell the listeners about is this group called La Cagoule. And I, again, I, know, I have no idea if I'm saying this right. I had not heard uh, of this group. I believe group. it's Cagoule. All right, so... Kagul, you know, all right. Cool, <laughs> sure. At least so, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or as I guess they were more informally known as the Hood or the Cowl. So I had not heard of this group prior to reading your research, uh, but I think that they're just as important as the Knights of Malta, as P2, as Opus Dei, and as the Circle. Yes, yes. Well, Kagul basically uh, it means the Hood or the Cowl, but yes. They were sort of began as a paramilitary arm of Action France, which was a political movement in the 1930s that essentially was trying to prevent the socialists coming to power, which they had failed to do. Leon Blum, I believe, was elected as the socialist prime minister of France in the 30s. And that's uh, what had essentially spurred uh, Cagoule to go on a, essentially a terror campaign in the middle part of the decade. I think it was like 36, 37 was the apex of their operations. There were several bombings, there were several assassinations and so on that were carried out uh, in France, especially in the Paris region and what have you. And then the organization was broken up by the French police towards the end of the decade, but going into the early 1940s, many of the members had been released from prison, partly just because of the Nazi invasion coming at the time. And I should probably stop here and send a preface by saying that a lot of the uh, Kagouls were not necessarily supportive of Nazism. A lot of them in the 1930s had actually been working towards kind of the creation of a Latin fascist league, if you will, that would have united France and Italy and Spain together as kind of a, a counterbalance to Nazi Germany. Of course, France had just been defeated by Germany in the First World War, which was obviously in the 1930s still a rather bit of a sensitive spot for the French at the time. And the reemergence of Germany as a major power under Hitler was definitely a concern for many of the conservative elements of France, including the uh, Kagul. So when uh, the Nazis effectively invaded and conquered France, it led to a bit of a divided loyalty. Some of the Kaguls had actually ended up going with de Gaulle and had joined up at the resistance. And then there were obviously many, though, who chose to stay and work with the Nazis. But the Kagul was... It definitely had a curious legacy in that sense. It was not necessarily, I mean, a hardline Nazi party, but I mean, it certainly was a fascist one. Yeah, so you said, quote, on the one hand, then, La Cagoule was another fascist militia like the ones that had terrorized uh, multiple Western European nations during the Cold War era. You also noted that they had the same a modus operandi of many fascist groups that became involved in the uh, U.S.-NATO stay-behind networks such as Gladio. 
And like those organizations, the hood or the cowl here sought to destabilize a democratic government and replace it with a fascist regime. But you also said there was a fundamentally occult nature to this group, which not only revolves around their attire, which was similar to the KKK, but also because much of their political ideology came from an idea called synarchy. Now, that's come up on the show before, uh, but only briefly back in episode 89 uh, with Gary Lockman. Could you tell us a bit about synarchy and how it relates to the hood here? Well, additional research I've done since I've written that, I'm not sure how much synarchy actually had an influence on the Kugul. It is known, though, that the founder of the Kugul, Eugene Delonche, I believe, was involved with the synarchist movement, but it's it's difficult to say just how much of the ideology was actually incorporated into the ghoul or not, but it's certainly they did adopt the pose of kind of a quasi-Masonic organization with initiation rites and uh, obviously the costumes and the regalia and what have you. And ironically, uh, I should probably point out, too, that based on some of the pictures that have come out from the P2 meetings, it looks like Propaganda 2 actually adapted these sort of warped Klansman robes that were worn by the Kugul in the 1930s, which certainly has led to some speculation about the origins that there, at least the overlap that these groups might have had with one another. As far as the Synarchists go, I mean, it's definitely a highly debatable topic here. Synarchy was a concept that had been devised uh, in the 19th century by another Frenchman whose name was uh, Alexandre saint Yves. And his ideology was heavily promoted by Pappas, the uh, famous French occultist who had also been a doctor in the French army. And anyway, uh, Pappas would later go, would go on to create the Martinist order, which in some levels at least promoted synarchy at the highest levels. But again, this is all very speculative. But given the overlap between, or at least the use of this sort of secret society paraphernalia by the Kugul and so forth, it's definitely led to some speculation that there was very firm connections between the Synarchist movement and the Kagul, but again, that's very highly speculative, and it's definitely something that, I don't want to say it was totally bogus or anything like that, but I mean, I definitely have had to re-question some of the information that I gathered on that, especially since a lot of the Synarchist material comes from Lyndon LaRoche, who isn't necessarily the world's most uh, reliable researcher. <laughs> So could you tell us a little bit more about when this concept of synarchy first appeared during the late 19th century? Because there's this uh, really interesting figure, uh, Joseph Alexander St. Eves, that I think should maybe touch on here. Well, yes, I mean, it essentially appeared in the uh, late 19th century. Um, I believe he was kind of a moderate aristocrat. He had married the Countess uh, Maria Richard Keller, I believe, who was allegedly a Russian aristocrat. And uh, he also had apparently been on friendly terms with Edward Byer Leithen, who wrote The Coming Race, which had uh, introduced the concept of real forces and what have you. He had also been one of the individuals who had come up with the concept of the Garthia, which was kind of, uh, which plays into a lot of the hollow earth concepts of the Ascended Masters and so on and so forth. Definitely an interesting figure. Yeah, so I feel like we're just kind of naming off groups here and their ties to everybody that we've been talking about, but that's kind of the point of the chat, I think. So let's talk about another group that has ties to this. Well, actually, two groups, I guess. Tell us a little bit about the Academy and the Sixth International. All right, so the Academy was a Belgian group that had been founded in the, I believe it was actually 1969, like right at the end of the uh, 60s, obviously. The actual name, and I knew I'm going to butcher this, but was the... Academia Europeanus de Sciences Politics. Usually it was referred to as ASEP or simply the Academy, which is what we'll go with here because I can actually pronounce that. And the founder was Flohamad Damian, who had actually been related to one of the individuals who had come up with the Sniffer airplane. That's probably how Violet had gotten hooked up with these individuals in the first place. And the Academy is I mean, it's a very interesting organization in the sense that it kind of was a meeting ground, if you will, between the overworld and these really exclusive organizations like Bilderberg and Le Cercle and so forth with many of these VIPs in it and these more you know, right-wing underground groups that were used in paramilitary and terrorist uh, actions throughout Europe. Of course, not long after the Academy had been founded, Daman had encountered Garen Sarek, Yves Garen Sarek, quote-unquote, God's terrorist, the founder of the Gentry Press. And there had been some conversations between the two about future collaborations, though it's unknown how and to what extent that went to. But certainly, I mean, he was really one of the premier right-wing terrorists throughout the 70s. He was deeply involved in a lot of the years of lead in Italy and so on and so forth. 
a jitter was set up by the Portuguese intelligence actually just a few years before the academy in the late 1960s, and it essentially had been used on the one hand to help them with the colonial struggle in Africa at the time that they were going through, and also to essentially suppress descendants within Portugal itself, and then later on they basically branched out all over Europe and really the entire world in a host of terror actions and so on. But definitely a jitter was one of the most serious of these groups for many years. It was largely comprised of a lot of veterans of the OAS, the secret army organization that had tried to displace Charles de Gaulle and after the uh, failed general's push of 1961. And also there were definitely ties to P2 uh, with the academy via P7, which had several members there who were, there was an overlap between. And then also some of the members directly involved with the academy had contact with some of the, you know, kind of neo-fascist organizations in Italy at the time that would be used in the strategy of tension there. And then also in Belgium itself, of course, Belgium was rocked by its own strategy of tension in the 1980s, known as the Bloody 80s, and quite a few members that were linked to that were also involved in the academy. So the academy really, during its run from the late 60s to around 1980, seems to have been a, a key meeting ground for these different factions, on the one hand, with these very elite individuals, people that were involved with Le Cercle and Bilderberg, who had access to a considerable amount of money, and then on the other hand, a lot of these essentially shock troops that were willing to go out and spill blood in the streets, essentially. Yeah, and I think you also noted that uh, these groups, the Academy, Six International, and so on, that they might have been actually intelligence-gathering arms of the circle. Is there any evidence for that? Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely think so. I mean, again, with the uh, Circle, I mean, most of the members there have been linked to the intelligence community in the early years, and this connection became much more pronounced in the 60s when you started to have more of an involvement from the Anglo-Americans in the organization Brian Crozier was really the first British individual who became, I mean, he probably wasn't the first, but he was the first really prominent one who became involved with this network. Crozier was also a member of the Academy, uh, which was linked closely to his Institute for the Study of Conflict. But um, after Crozier became involved, though, I mean, most of the other Brits who came in were members of the Special Operations Executive, which was essentially the UK's dirty tricks department during World War II. Churchill, of course, had famously commanded them to set Europe ablaze, to resist the Nazi occupation, and that's effectively what they did. And a lot of accounts argue that the SOE was actually what Gladio had originally been based upon and not without merit. I mean, essentially, it had also been used to set up resistance networks throughout mainland Europe to attack the Nazis, and this was basically what the official reason for Gladio's existence was, to set up resistance networks that would attack the communists in the event of an invasion. But you had all of these, you know, SOE guys that were involved with it in the UK, and then when the American partners started to be introduced, I mean, one of the first was William Casey, who, of course, would go on to become the CIA director under Ronald Reagan. Another big figure was Frank Barnett, who had been involved with the American Security Council in the United States, and he was also you know, very heavily attached to the intelligence community in general. So certainly by the 60s going into the 70s, I mean, certainly, I mean, most of its membership, especially from the United States and the UK, were almost all intelligence officers. And it definitely raises the distinct possibility that this was effectively uh, a kind of private intelligence network that had been set up probably to manage these, you know, Gladio networks. I mean, certainly Le Sucla has been linked to the strategy of tension in both Italy and Belgium, and to a lesser extent, Portugal as well. Yeah, you also mentioned that these networks uh, helped get Ronald Reagan elected, as well as Margaret Thatcher. What role did they play exactly in the elections of Reagan and Thatcher? Well, it was much more so with the election of Thatcher. Uh, this goes to Crozier's network. Crozier, of course, had the, the Institute for the Study of Conflict, which was essentially his official think tank, but then he had two more uh, exclusive organizations. One of them was known as the SHIELD, which was essentially a domestic-based organization, and then there was the 6i, which was the international wing, effectively. But these were private intelligence networks that were effectively working for the election of Ronald Reagan, or excuse me, Margaret Thatcher in the 19, late 1970s in the UK. And again, I mean, Crozier had almost all, I mean, totally staffed this with a lot of ex-intelligence officers, some of them who were still with MI6. Certainly, I mean, and this led to the rise of the Iron Lady. In the case of Reagan, it was not quite as pronounced, but 
the connections that the circular had to Casey were probably a factor into that, and certainly it raises the possibility that this might have been a network to provide covert funding for the election of Reagan in 1980 as well. And lastly, you know, one more thing, though, before we go, you have a book project that you're working on with fellow uh, researcher Frank Zero, which is very much in line with all we've discussed here. Uh, It's not out yet, but I did want to give you a chance to talk a bit about that book project. Yeah, no, it's very exciting. Um, I'm sure, I mean, a lot of regular readers of the blog have probably been wondering why there have been virtually no updates for the last couple of months, and this is essentially why I've been trying to get this book finished, essentially. It's going to be a collection of essays, though. I'm the principal author on them, and Frank is also contributing um, a few, and there might be at least one other person contributing some, but it's going to be roughly based around the use of trauma and how it's used to reorient societies from, you know, different parties and what have you. In my case in particular, I've uh, contributed three essays to it. One I'm actually still working on at the moment, though. Hopefully it will be finished by the time you post this. But uh, one of the essays is going to be on the mysterious Mellon family, which we've uh, talked about here briefly, and uh, specifically the possibility that they might have been linked to MK Ultra and Artichoke and that type of thing. The next one, which I'm very pleased with, is on Colonia Dignidad. It's about 30,000 words, so I believe it's going to be, at this point, the longest English language account of the colony that is yet to be published. I think it's it's really going to put a, the colony in a perspective, an interesting perspective from the uh, international relations that it had. Of course, a lot has been written about you know the actual colony itself and what went on there, but there hasn't really been a lot of effort made to kind of discern the players behind it and I mean how it uh, was able to gain so much protection and power within Chile in the uh, 60s and 70s. And then the essay that I'm currently working on, which will probably be between 25 and 30,000 words by the time I'm finished, is on the basically the rise of private security and private uh, military companies. It's going to specifically consider Dying Poor, Blackwater, Aegis, and SAIC, and uh, it's going to have a lot of other very interesting information in it, especially as it pertains to the Trump regime, because there's a lot of connections between Trump and specifically some of these really radical uh, private military companies, which I think has some very unsettling possibilities for the future of this country. So it's going to be very timely, if nothing else. Yeah, man, absolutely. And you and Frank are both welcome here when that book does come out. So I look forward to checking it out. Before we go, then, tell people where they can find the blog if they're interested. Uh, you can find it at uh, Visa View. The uh, web address is uh, visaview.blogspot.com. Visa is C-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W. And uh, like I said, hopefully the new book will, I don't think it will be out by that time, but we will hopefully have some more information uh, with the publishing and what have you. We could maybe uh, send that on to you so you could post it along with a podcast or something. Definitely, yeah, yeah. We will link everything we can in the show notes to people and uh, direct them to the appropriate places for sure. So, Recluse, hey man, thanks so much for the time. It was nice to actually get back on a call with you and at least give listeners just a, a nice overview of some of these groups and what they may be up to behind the scenes and hopefully expose more of your work to the general public uh, as well. Absolutely, and uh, thank you for having me back. <laughs> Being so patient as we kind of outlined in the beginning, it was uh, a long and winding road to get here doing this interview. I have learned how to be patient over the last couple of years, so... No problem there, for sure. I look forward to chatting with you again sometime soon, though, because I think we have a bit more to cover here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there you have it. My thanks again to Recluse for stopping by. We'll get him back sooner rather than later for the next installment of this Dark Nights series. We have so much more to cover, and it's only going to get realer and closer to home and closer to the heart of the uh, quote-unquote deep state. But for real, read the blogs linked in the show notes because we could have chatted for six hours about all the blog entries linked there. But the purpose of this is to introduce the players, give some background, and then hopefully hand you off to the blog where it's all laid out in in much greater and much easier to understand detail. Uh, There was a short Patreon extension here, about 15 to 20 minutes, where we did chat a bit about the American Security Council and its ties to the circle, uh, the Mellon family's low-key role in American sociopolitics, the International Committee for the Defense of Christian Culture, the circle's worldwide spiritual offensive, 
Opus Dei's possible connections to Rick Santorum, the Penn State football scandal, and the death of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, and of course Donald Trump and his mentor Roy Cohn's ties to the Knights of Malta. So like I said, only about 15 to 20 minutes, but you know, we're two bucks a month. You can sign up for that at patreon.com slash occulture and join fine folks like Christy, Dapper B, Kevin, and Cindy who all hopped on board recently or hopped back on board in some cases. And thanks to all of you who keep supporting. It's much appreciated and it continues to give me familiar and overwhelmingly warm feelings and continues to keep me wide-eyed and hopeful for our future here together. Of course, the future does not exist. Never has, never will. So best to choose to just be here right now with each other in this moment. And there will be another moment like this one, though, where we will twirl around with another familiar parable. But until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.